In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today is the second Sunday of the blessed month of Misra. As we know, this is the month before the last of the Coptic year. And the church arranged the readings in a certain way that calls upon us to meditate on certain meetings that are befitting the end of a year and the approaching new year, new Coptic year. So today was the calling, as we heard, calling of St. Matthew to become one of the disciples. And as we just heard, that he forsook everything and followed Christ wholeheartedly. We never heard of Levi or Matthew going back and becoming part-time uh, tax collector. His life changed entirely. And that's why today we find Christ speaking about no one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. What did he mean with this? Why he's speaking these kind of words in this occasion when he called a sinner, a Levi, to become a disciple? The meaning Christ wants to attract our attention to is, are you leading a new life in me or are you just patching an old life? This is a very common temptation that we know whenever we are about maybe to vow something or to say to ourselves, my, my life is going to be different. I am going to lead a new life in Christ. We find the easiest thing is to just keep the old garment and just patch it. So this is what we are going to talk about today in a few minutes. Is it a new life or just patching? So we'll talk about four points. The first one, forms of patching. The second, weakness or duality. The third, the serious consequences of this life of patching. And the fourth one is the new life in Christ. There are multiple forms of patching life. One of them is to have a spiritual practice with no change of heart. The most common one is fasting. Fasting approaches and we say this fast is going to be something different. And then it ends up with just changing the food. The same lifestyle, nothing it changed. The same indulgence on social media and wasting time. Living a life of secular pleasures away from the commandment of Christ. The only thing that it changed is I changed what I'm eating. Changing the food here, or this kind of fasting, is just a batch. A batch to an old life that I want to hold on. I do not want to give it up. In the book of Isaiah, we hear this. When the people ask God, we fast and you do not look, or you do not uh, bless us when we practice this way. He said to them, God, in response to their question, in fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. The same injustice, the same cruelty, the same lifestyle, but you batched your life with a practice of fasting. Another form of patching is confessing a sin with no intention to change course. I just come and mention it before the priest, period, nothing more. I remember one time a person was confessing, saying, I am not tithing. I don't give anything. And I said to him, okay, you know this is a sin, and definitely maybe God moved your heart today to come and confess it. Are you planning to tithe from now on? He said, I'm not sure. I don't think so. So what exactly am I doing by coming and telling the priest, I'm committing a certain sin? but I'm still doing it. I will hold on it. I'm just patching my life with the practice of confession. I come and sit before the priest and say, give me absolution, but I will continue to live in the same way. Another form of patching is attending the liturgy while being on my phone. While I'm talking, I'm sure there are some of the maybe kids, young people, maybe adults, are on their phones. So why I'm here? Coming to the liturgy is here to worship and honor God 
this supposedly to be the new life that I am pursuing. But if I am here to do anything but this, then the liturgy becomes a form of patching, just to numb my conscience. Then I feel good. I was in the liturgy today, I took communion. While the whole liturgy, I was just insulting God by being on my phone while the service was taking place. Another form also is serving in the church while partaking in the world's sinful amusement and mockery. College is about to start in a week, and many of our kids, they go to college, many of them are serving in the church. And when they are in college, they forget the new life that they accepted, or the new pursuit of holiness that they vowed when they accepted the task of serving. Many of them serve here in the church in multiple capacities. They go to college and then everything is forgotten. There is a party and there is drinking and dancing and all kinds of entertainment that's according to the world standard. And then we participate. We take place in this. And then what do we call exactly the service that we are pursuing in the church? It's just a patch. It's not a new life in any way. And when we do this, we bring dishonor and shame to the service and to the name of the Lord, whom we confess at the church and we do otherwise outside. So sad when somebody come and say, Buna, do you hear what the service or the servant is doing outside? So and so and so. And then he is not talking about a person. He is calling him a servant to bring it to the Father that this is how the servants are behaving. It's a patch again to an old life that the person is holding on, not willing to change. Another form also is confessing Christ as Lord in hymns and denying him in words and behavior outside of the church. So stunning when you hear that a person who comes to the church, a regular church goer. In the church, he is singing, praising, or even serving. At home, he cusses with the worst words in the language of cussing. And you wonder how he can do this or she can do this. How we can combine both. How we become like this. It's again the idea of patching. It's not a new life in any way. This is the form I put on in order to convince myself that my life is coming to a change. This is what God rebuked the people about when he said, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Another form of patching also is the Pharisees' style of focusing on the outside while the inside is defiled. So careful not to drink something after 12 a.m. in the morning so I can take communion. But I don't mind coming to the church and then being engaged in a family fight, say any kind of bad words to my family, and I come here and in, at the door of the church as if nothing happened. So these are forms. They are not the only forms of batching, but the idea, the concept is this. Life is not changing. I'm just keeping the old man I'm just patching the outside of it. But the question that will come to our minds is, Abuna, we are all sinners. We all, me included, for sure. So aren't we all patching our lives? We have to differentiate here between sin as a weakness or sin as a lifestyle and duality as a major sin in the life of many of the believers. What is the difference? Am I doing this out of weakness or I'm living a double life? There are certain signs of sin out of weakness. The first sign is a person commit a sin being overtaken in a trespass, sudden, unplanned, something that happens while I am off guard. It doesn't really take much time before I realize this is wrong come back to myself. With this kind of weakness, there is deep sense of remorse, determination to try harder. I would never be able to live like this. I can 
maybe fall in a second, but there is no way I can keep this dragging for days or weeks or months because this is weakness. Weakness also would be manifested when the person is diligent in receiving medicine. Prayer is medicine, fasting is medicine, coming to the church is medicine, confession. All of these kind of practices are medicines. What is my excuse to say I'm not taking any of these? Or I'm taking my medicine irregularly, without consistency, with carelessness. If I am doing a sin out of weakness, then I am keen to take my medicine. This is the theme. But if I am careless about my medicine, then it is not weakness. It is by intention. I don't care. As simple as that, it is again a life of duality. With weakness also we find quick repentance and change of course immediately. Once I fall, I stand up, come back to myself. There is sincere struggle and there is self-judgment. I bring it to myself. It is me. It is my fault. And the correction takes place instantly. Duality has other manifestation. The first sign of duality is that sinning is deliberate with planning and execution. Seeing something that's immoral suddenly, something that comes over the phone and a person is off guard watching this in a minute, maybe can be interpreted as weakness. But to have an application with immoral, where you can connect with immoral people, you have someone in your life that you know that this relation is immoral. Going to him or her, living together in sin. I cannot say that this is weakness. This is duality. This is deliberate. It took me time. I planned it. I lived it. If I say to myself, I am weak, I'm just cheating myself. No, I'm not serious yet about my spiritual life. Another sign of duality also is that no true repentance. When the person is confronted, what he usually says is, oh, everybody is doing the same and other people. If you are truly penitent, you wouldn't justify. You wouldn't argue. You wouldn't hide even. You come forward and say, I did it. Avoiding confrontation, avoiding your father of confession is just a sign of duality. I just want to live like this. I have a form in the church and I have a true person that only me know about outside of the church. Carelessness becomes a theme. I don't care. As simple as that. I can be as the people around me are doing. Are doing. Negligence, disrespect of the spiritual medicine. Persons say that I am weak. You ask him, are you fasting? I don't like fasting food. Then what? Imagine a person who truly knows that he is sick. He goes to his doctor. The doctor prescribes a medicine. He goes back and says, I didn't take it because it is bitter. It's sour. I don't like it. If you really feel your weakness and you feel your illness, you wouldn't treat a medicine like this. But it's a sad thing and it's a sign of duality. With duality also comes, while I'm a sinner, I am so much indulged in judging others, feeling entitled I should receive better treatment, justifying myself, finding excuse of my lifestyle. All of these says that I am living a double life. The third point is the serious consequences of this kind of batching of life. Number one is that's the most serious actually, is God's rejection of the offering. I assume that because I came to the church today and I was all the time on my phone and distracted, I came late, I just went to the communion room, took communion, then I'm okay. I'm right with God. Who said this? How did I convince myself that this is the case? This is not true. God will never accept something like this. Will never accept patching or duality. God says this to Jeremiah, when they fast, the people of Israel, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and green offering, I will not accept them. God knows that they are not sincere in their practices. 
He said to Isaiah also, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. This kind of combination of right and wrong in the same place was never tolerated, accepted by God. The second serious consequence is numbness of the conscience, loss of sense of need to change. If I am out entirely, then I know there is something that's wrong. But if I am in and out, I am part-time in the church, part-time in the world. I am worshiping on Sunday, living as a pagan from Monday to Saturday. I feel good because Sunday at the end of the day, I'm here. Then my conscience is numb. I don't feel like I need to change. I even have a title. I'm a servant, I'm a deacon, I'm a priest, whatever it is. I don't need to change then. The third one is becoming a major source of offense and blaspheme against and blasphemy against God. People are stumbling in God because of people in the church who are living this kind of duality. This is the major offense to other people outside. When they see those people who are confessing faith on Sunday, they go outside and do the opposite in the rest of the days of the week. This becomes the major offense against the religion, against our Christianity, against the life in Christ. The last point is how the new life in Christ should look like. We hear this. St. Paul speaks to the Corinthians. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. As I said at the beginning, when Matthew, the tax collector, was called to the ministry, it is once and for all. It's done. Today, I am a disciple. I am no more a tax collector. If I'm in Christ, this is a new creation. Again, in the same epistle, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, St. Paul says this so clearly. He says, For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. These words should be ringing in our ears every time when we try to have this impossible balance, to have light and darkness in the same place, having this kind of double life, convincing myself I am okay because I am part-time a believer. The new life in Christ is the only way where I can taste the goodness of God. Many people say, I come to the church often, but I don't feel anything. Maybe the question should be, am I living a new life or I'm just batching? If I batch, I am not doing either. I am not 100% secular, 100% a believer. I don't taste any of these. It's exactly like someone when I called him, are you fasting? He said half and half. What's half and half mean? I'm just like, again, in between. Can this person taste what exactly is the goodness of fast? Never. No way. I'm not doing it wholeheartedly. Coming to the liturgy, again, while I'm indulged on my form, or coming so late, you'll never taste the liturgy. It will always be a burden. The new life is the only way where I can taste truly the goodness of God. It is the new life in Christ that can satisfy the human heart and give purpose and meaning to the person's existence. Only when I live it wholeheartedly, when I mean it, when the whole thing is new, I'm not just batching an old one. The calling from the church today, while we're approaching the end of the Coptic year, about to start a new one, if we are to lead a new life, if we are to make a new start, it is about changing all, about being sincere in the pursuit, not just batching and being satisfied with it. May the Lord to grant us all a new life in Him, and glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.